with you this morning. We're going to be looking at Colossians chapter 2 and 3. And uh, if you just have that available to you, you'll be looking at that a little bit later. We live in a culture that tells us what is acceptable, what should be celebrated, and what should be tolerated. But most of what they're telling us goes against biblical truth. Our society has moved so far away from a standard of truth, and those boundaries keep moving. People of my generation, the baby boomers, gave way to a anything goes and it feels if it feels good do it mentality virtually anything now is acceptable we have rapidly declined into celebrating those things that go against biblical truth state legislatures as we're seeing in the news celebrate the killing of babies up to and including birth and even propose letting them die even after they are born. How can this be right? Alternative lifestyles are to be tolerated, even to the extent of allowing boys and girls restrooms and locker rooms, and vice versa. And if you dare question it, you are wrong and intolerant. The prophet Isaiah warns in chapter 5 of the book that bears his name, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Our society is where it is because we have rejected biblical truth. It is where it is, because we have become wise in our own eyes and clever in our own sight. We are where we are because false views have led to false living. Now, we've been looking at life through God's periscope the last couple of weeks, looking at our society, looking at the world in which we live in a way that is characteristic of what God wants us to see. We need to recognize that there are false views out there. There are many false ideologies that are going around and they infiltrate the church, but they lead to false living. In other words, a lot of the living that we see today, a lot of the culture decline we see today stems from the false views. And we want to consider that this morning, if you'd follow with me. First of all, false views distort the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is, is clear. God loved the world so much that he sent his only son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. What could be more clearer than that? God's love for us was not one of legalism. It was not one of distorting the views of ideology, but it's one of inclusive, inclusion to bring us into a belief system that follows the scriptures that he's given to us. There are many worldviews out there. There are too many for us to really consider in a, a forum like this. But we will address two of them today. One of them has been around for thousands of years. The other is relatively more recent. But they both affect what we're talking about this morning when we look at false views and false living. The first of these is legalism. We mentioned it just a moment ago. But legalism attempts to impose God's righteousness 
by rules and regulations. It's been around all of my life. I've seen it from my early years in the church, but it's been around for thousands of years. It attempts to produce righteousness really apart from God. You say, oh, no, 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 no. When, legalism isn't that. Uh, when, when, the, the church does not try to impose, uh, uh, impose righteousness apart from God. It's just telling us how God wants us to live. Well, the, the problem with that is the church oftentimes has become so pointedly direct in the way that we believe that things have to be in order to meet some standard, that it becomes legalistic. You don't need God as long as you go through the checklist and do everything right. You don't need God in your life if you just do the right things. If you just do everything according to the letter of the law, one becomes a righteous person. You don't need God's power. You only need willpower. You need the willpower to do all those right things. Legalism implies that you have to be a certain way in order to, to be a Christian. The ones that we're more familiar with, perhaps, if you just dress the right way, you know? Everybody has to dress a certain way and, 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 and appear, have that appearance of being a Christian. Go to church so many times a week. Follow all the rules. Do the things that the church says you have to do, and then you'll, you'll be okay. You have to follow man's standards. I, I know that standards are important, but so many times when we emphasize standards that are ex, in ex extra standards from the, what the Bible teaches, uh, then we say, well, whose standards are they? It's one man's interpretation over another man's interpretation, and that becomes very uh, distorted. The other, the other view that we want to talk about this morning is postmodernism. Uh, that's a term that you may have heard. It's uh, floating around. Postmodernism rejects the belief that something is necessarily true for everyone. Postmodernists believe that there is no absolute truth, that there is just no truth that applies for everybody all the time. Truth, then, is created rather than something to be discovered. We don't look at the Bible and, and say, what is the truth of the scriptures that we need to adopt and need to learn, to need to apply to our lives? In this view, truth only exists to the extent that one wants it to exist. So something may be true for you, that, but it may not be true for me. Something that may be true for me may not be true for you. And so we leave that into a situation where we just say, well, it, it may be okay, but it doesn't always apply. When confronted with biblical truth, postmodernists often respond, oh, I don't believe that. I don't believe that applies today. I don't believe that's for me. They'll go as far as to say, well, that might be okay for you. Or that might be your, your truth or your reality, but it's not mine. But the true Christ follower puts his or her confidence in Jesus Christ, who is the truth. We have to go back to scriptures and biblical truth and to understand just what truth is. In John chapter 18, when Jesus stood before Pilate, before his crucifixion, we read these words. You are a king then, said Pilate. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. 
Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. You remember that scripture? You remember that in the Easter story? You remember that in the passion of Jesus when leading up to the crucifixion? What is truth? Pilate asked that question thousands of years ago. Well, what is truth? Jesus proclaimed that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He proclaimed himself to be the truth. And we also know, in that verse continues, that says, no one comes to the Father except through me. A lot of people have trouble with that verse today. A lot of people deny its truthfulness today. Because it sounds exclusive, it sounds like it sets Christianity above other religions. But the scriptures teach us, in chapter 4 of the book of Acts, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. There is no other way. Is this true? Is this true? If we believe that the Bible is true, if we believe that the Bible is the authoritative scriptures, then this is the truth. And when we believe other things, when other false views come into play, then living, our false living follows. The second point we want to talk about today is is just that, that false living is the result of false views. A man by the name of Christian Smith described how Christian young people view the Bible, the Christian life, and themselves. And I'm not singling out Christian young people or young people per se, because, you know, the young people's views that we t- talked about the last couple of weeks have come from the teachings of older people. It's come from university professors. It's come from even people who attend church. The, the, the views have become distorted. And so it's not just young people. It's young people grow into older people. We all did, didn't we? And so... The, the term that this man, Christian Smith, coined to describe this was moralistic, therapeutic deism. Now, I don't expect you to have to remember that because it's just one of those terms, but I do want to uh, view the things, that the, the key elements of this uh, description. And you'll see very familiar things here. Number one... They believe that a God exists who created and ordered the world and watches over human life on earth. We all believe that, don't we? We believe that there's a God, and we believe that there is the God. But people today, a lot of young people, believe there, there, there's, a, there's a, 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 a spiritual being, there is a God, who created and ordered the world and watches over human life on earth. Now, these are... This, this uh, description applies specifically to Christian young people. Number two, God wants people to be good. Well, I would think that that's a belief that we would have. Nice and fair to each other as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. One of the things that seems to be true about most world religions is people should be good. Thirdly, the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. Now we start to get into the problem. Because if life means, the central goal of life is I need to be happy and I need to feel good about me, then if there's something that is in the Bible that tells me that I'm not doing the right thing, hmm, 
I don't want to read that. I don't want to hear that. I don't want that to be a part of me, so I'm going to reject that. Or if there's something in the Bible that says I shouldn't do this, but it won't make me happy if I don't do this, well, then I, I can be happy. I should be happy because God wants me to be happy. Fourthly, God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. Oh, we see that so many times. When do people go to church? A lot of people go to church when they are going through a problem. When things are going good in their lives, they don't go to church. They, they're, they're too busy doing other things. They don't need God. But something goes bad in their life, well, then you'll see them in church for a few weeks. Maybe, if you're lucky. They'll come, they'll come and maybe ask for help. They may ask for prayer. They may even seek counsel for a while. But it goes back to the, the, the normal after that. And the last is good people go to heaven when they die. This is a view that many people have. If you're good, you're going to go to heaven. It's all there is to it. Just, just be good, and when you die, you'll go to heaven. Now, what we need to understand is that our worldview is the basis for our moral and ethical choices. The choices we make, we make them on the basis of our worldview. And so if our worldview is legalism, we're going to make choices based on that. If our worldview is postmodernism, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to uh, make our choices based on that. If it's one of the many other worldviews out there, we're going to make our choices on that. But if our, if our worldview is a biblical worldview, then we need to look at the Bible as our authority. The Bible needs to be that which governs what we are going to do, our choices that we make. Born-again adults with a biblical worldview are more likely to identify the Bible as a source of truth. Many of us in this room today would say the Bible is our authority. The Bible is truth. What the Bible says ought to be followed. The Bible is truth our guide. Those who actively attend church and are are more likely to identify the Bible as a source of truth as well, because we take that biblical worldview. Having false views, or in other words, a view that ignores biblical truth, adversely affects our moral choices. Our moral behavior results from what we believe. It's not surprising, I don't think, that many professing Christians are not living biblically because we're following other worldviews. We've let other things creep in to govern the way we think and the way we act. But what is significant and may be surprising is that many professing Christians don't care. That many just, they, they, they don't care if they're following the biblical worldview or not. If we aren't even trying to live biblically, we will not be living the Christian life successfully. I've run into many people in my experience that are frustrated and wonder why they cannot get ahead spiritually. It seems for them they take one step forward and two steps backward. They, they, they bemoan that they can't get the victory over the things in life. They cannot get themselves on the right track. They try and try and try, but it doesn't work for them. And the answer to that is it goes back to a biblical worldview. If we aren't willing to submit to God in all areas of our lives, we will not be victorious over sin and temptation. We are not going to be able to rise above the sin that is out there, and we all do. We're not going to be able to rise above the temptation. Temptation is going to be so strong, and we will not yield to it. Anger, gossiping, lust, 
premarital sex, pornography, and adultery are not rare among those who attend church and call themselves Christians. Did I say that correctly? Did you catch that? It, they are not rare, which means they are more common than we like to think. The truth is, there are many people probably sitting here today who struggle with these areas of their lives. Certainly, the, being in a church or being a part of a church is not immune to that. There is a difference between churchgoers and Christ followers, we know. But we do look at the church and realize that there are people within the church who struggle as well. False views lack the power to make a difference. This has been my frustration over the years. This has been my, my wish, per, per se, that we could get the victory over these things, that we would see transformed lives more and more. The reason why false views don't do it is that they are based on man's views. And they often reflect our selfish preferences. Again, I go back to the, the idea of what uh, often is set, uh, followed by people in that postmodern view. They will often say, God wants me to be happy. Therefore, I can do this or that. You can fill in the blank. Because God wants me to be happy. Why wouldn't God want me to be happy? God loves me. And that just is a distorted view. They rely upon the elemental forces of this world, relying upon the physical. And we talked about this last Sunday. Relying upon the physical rather than the spiritual. Man's idea rather than God's idea. When we follow man's wisdom, man's theories, man's ideology, it becomes distorted. And so where does that bring us today? Where does that bring us as we live our lives, as we are on this spiritual journey, as we sang this morning, being transformed into Christ's image? What, what God wants to do for you and me, what God wants for each and every one of us, is for us to be more like Jesus every day and every day and every day. How are we doing? How are you doing? How am I doing? Am I more like Jesus today than I was a month ago or a year ago or a decade ago? Are you more like Jesus today than you were before? That's the goal. That's what should be happening. And so Paul addresses this in Colossians chapter 2 and 3. He wondered if we were ever going to get there, and now we're going to get there. The first part of chapter, last part of chapter 2, verses 16 uh, to 23, the, these verses talk about these, these false views. It talks about there how, how there are things that Men say the, 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 the things of, of certain days being honored over other days and all these other things that for the, the church at Colossae in the Bible days struggled with. We know in the book of Galatians, he addresses things that the church of Galatia struggled with and the legalism of all those things. But then he comes to chapter 3, and that's what we want to focus on this morning, we want to focus on what he says we should do because our Christian response must reflect a biblical worldview. How do we reflect a biblical worldview? Well, it begins in chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, when Paul said this, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him 
in glory. We are to set our minds on the things above. Our minds are very powerful. If we focus our thoughts, we focus our minds on biblical worldview, if we focus our minds on the things that deal with God's plan, things above, then we are going to move in that direction. The biblical mindset is an eternal perspective. It acknowledges that there is more than this life, that there is life beyond the grave. It doesn't just end when we draw our last breath. It's not eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die, so who cares? It's not, it's not that we go through life just doing things for this world in which we live, but we recognize that there is an eternity, there is an eternal, to, eternal perspective. And our life is hidden with Christ in God. Christ dwells within the hearts of believers. Christ is in our hearts by his Holy Spirit. And by being in our hearts, he hides us in God. We are hidden with him in God. And the second thing Paul says we are to do is we are to put to death the earthly nature. And again, this is a hard passage to read sometimes. Because he says in verse 5, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to you, to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of its creator. We are to put to death the earthly nature. These things are in contrast to a, world, a, bibi a biblical worldview. When, when we t talk about the things that are affecting our society today, it, it go, they go against what Scripture teaches. I know we have come to the place, come to the time in our, in our society where things that the church, from a biblical worldview, say are wrong, the world says, that's just archaic. That is just prudent, being, being a prude. It, it, that's not reality. Sexual immorality and impurity are rampant today. It's, it's amazing to me. And I know it shows my age, I guess. It starts to reflect my being around a while. But it, it, I can't imagine what it does to those of you who are a little older than I am, or even a lot older than I am. I can't, I can't imagine what it's like for you to see the culture today of couples living together outside of marriage, cohabitating as if that's the norm, and it's becoming the norm. The, the, the idea that Sexual immorality, not just with young people, but with, with uh, extramarital relationships and, and all kind of things, pornography, uh, all this falls into sexual immorality that is out there for people in the world today who deal with it, and, and so many people in the church. And I've heard people in the church, people in, not, not necessarily, I say the church, I'm talking about the church in general, Christianity, who have said, get with it. This is the way it is today. It's, this, this, this is, the, you know, no, all young people do this. Why, why not take your marriage on a test drive before you walk down the aisle? Make sure you're compatible. Make sure it's, it's, it's exciting. And make sure it's co you're compatible to, to, to get together that way. And it just, it's, it's culture has become that. Evil desires and greed. Th these are the things that are in contrast 
to a biblical worldview. And Paul says we used to walk in those ways. Before we come to Christ, those ways were more acceptable. But it we should put, put it this way, it's not unusual for those who are not saved to behave that way, but it should not be usual behavior for those who are saved. Those who are in the church, those who are in Christian life, should not find that to be usual. Anger and rage, malice and slander, those, those things are uh, built upon the other. For instance, when we get angry, it goes into rage. And have you seen some of these uh, things on the news where uh, road rage, uh, men jumping on hoods of cars and going on the freeway speeding out of road rage? I mean, common sense would tell me get off the hood before the car moves. And malice, to get back at people, to, to, to try to... to to, to ruin a person's character, slander, saying things like that are not true, filthy language. I can't believe that members of Congress use the perverted language even to, to talk about people like our president. And well, no matter what you think about him, the office of the president, it's just so unbecoming, this culture to use these kind of words. Lying. People think nothing about saying things that aren't true. Lying to one another. And Paul says, don't do it. He says we are to be renewed. Our new self is being renewed, he says, into what our creator intended to be. Our, in our creator intends for us to be transformed into the likeness of his son, Jesus Christ. He wants us to be more and more like Christ today. Our knowledge of this comes from a biblical worldview. For us to accept that comes from what the Bible teaches us. And so when we walk out of here today, as we go back to our routines of the week, you and I should consciously be wanting to be more like Jesus, to be more like him. Our transformation from the old self to the new self is the result of false views being replaced by the right views. And so if we want to live for Jesus, if we want to be the way he wants us to be, if we want our spiritual journey to be one of transformation, then we need to let God work in our lives. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 we end with this verse, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Again, Wednesday night in our 6 o'clock adult Bible study, Ron Wetley was going, is going to be sharing more about this topic and continuing on with our discussion but looking through God's periscope at false living calls us to attention. Values are rapidly deteriorating, and sad to say the problem has infiltrated the church at large. We must return to a biblical worldview that governs the way we live and relate to our culture rather than conforming to our culture. We must set our minds on things above, not on earthly things. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the message that it brings to our lives. Thank you for the Holy Spirit taking these words and applying them the way you want them applied. So, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for what you've shared with us this morning by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.